Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today. Uh, really exciting to be here for uh, the first Reinforce event. Um, just to show of hands, how many people are familiar with Twistlock? Have you heard of Twistlock before? Great. So it's awesome to see some hands go up. Um, the topic of my talk today is modernizing traditional security. Um, or in this world we're all in now, this notion of cloud-native security and how it's different than some of the legacy frameworks that we might all be used to. And one of the things I kind of want to introduce today is this notion from Andreessen Horowitz that everyone is pretty familiar with by this point, this notion that on one side of the coin, software is truly eating the world, but at the same time, the world is dangerous. And so if you think today about um, cloud-native software, um, you don't have to look far to recognize the fact that almost every company today and almost every industry is a software technology company. Um, modern software is uh, being deployed more quickly than ever before for a lot of different reasons. Uh, to provide competitive advantages, uh, to deliver end user business value, um, and ultimately it's being leveraged by developers because it makes them happier and more efficient. And ultimately, developers and DevOps teams want to use a modern toolkit to build and release software. And I think that's why we see the rise of things like Docker, Kubernetes, AWS Lambda, and AWS Fargate. And most organizations today using a combination of all of these different compute options. At the same time, um, not to be scary, but the world is dangerous. Um, and while developers are responsible in a lot of ways for building and deploying secure software, making sure it's patched, making sure it's updated, there are certainly attackers looking for gaps in your systems, um, looking to gather consumer data, proprietary data, um, and leverage automation or, or available toolkits to access that data as easily as possible. Um, they want to move quickly to gain access to as many systems as they can uh, in a quick way. And so this is the framework I want to talk about. Why does cloud native make security harder? We're also going to talk about on the next slide how it makes it easier. But there are certainly some things that we have to be aware of in adopting cloud native applications and workloads. Um, one, there are a lot of abstractions, especially from a networking standpoint, in this new cloud native world. You have the underlying host. You have some sort of Docker or container runtime. Uh, you have to manage your images and your containers. Um, you have the networking layer that you have to secure. And all the while, there are new compute options being released and new tech technologies kind of rising to the forefront. Think of Istio, the service mesh, and Knative, which is certainly kind of growing from kind of an interest standpoint. Um, there's a lot of technology to be concerned about. At the same time, um, there are just a lot more entities to secure. And that's really part of the fact that we're now talking about microservices. Um, so by that definition, we have a lot more small services that are more minimal uh, that we need to just keep track of and look at. Um, it's not uncommon for organizations to have tens of thousands of images spread across several registries running across you know, hundreds or thousands of hosts that they need to keep track of. Um, at the same time, and this is a real shift from kind of the legacy security framework, developers have a tremendous amount of control over the security of your infrastructure stack. And so this requires a new way of security working with the development and DevOps group and embedding security controls throughout the application lifecycle. And then finally, there's this notion that security really needs to be as portable as your applications are. Uh, developers are building code on the developer desktop, pushing it to a registry, pushing it to various testing or production environments. And so keeping track of all those environments and keeping security consistent is certainly a challenge to be aware of. At the same time, there are some tremendous opportunities where cloud native provides tr uh, advantages from a security perspective. Um, one, the ability to leverage automation uh, can, play, can really help scale security in new ways. Um, this notion of the ability to apply machine learning to actually understand application runtime behavior uh, is a trend that's only growing. And that really allows a security architect or a security team to really understand how their applications are not just running, but how they should be running securely. And this idea that if we can model what applications should do, it becomes easier to isolate them, uh, alert or block on activity when they're doing something they shouldn't. 
This is both um, from any process, file system activity, as well as networking components as well. And then finally, because microservices are more declarative, minimal, and just a smaller code base, it becomes a lot easier to integrate security into the CI CD process where your scanning becomes more accurate, precise, and quicker, uh, which developers, if you can give them results in their native tooling as part of their native workflows, security can really embed themselves across the you know, application pipeline. I talked a little bit earlier about how today's organizations really have more infrastructure options that, uh, than ever before. And this is one of the frameworks we use at Twistlock that we call the continuum of cloud-native topologies to think about all of these different compute options. And so if you think of all of these different options on a fulcrum, um, kind of like a teeter-totter, where on the left you have more isolation and more control, and as you move to the right, you have more ag agility, um, flexibility, um, simplicity as you move from virtual machines to serverless. And if you just look at the announcements um, from AWS in the community over the last couple of years, you see that there are a lot of new uh, application frameworks that organizations are already using that security needs to start to understand. Um, managed Kubernetes with EKS um, is certainly popular because it really alleviates the, um, the need for organizations to manage the underlying host uh, in their environments. Um, it's an easier way to manage, deploy, and update Kubernetes, which certainly provides a lot of advantages. Um, On-demand containers, uh, new frameworks like AWS Fargate, um, where you have kind of this container image-like instance that you're deploying as a task definition, uh, or even things like AWS Lambda, um, that you know, if you look at the last AWS reInvent announcement where Werner Vogel's talking about AWS Lambda layers, um, more and more of these frameworks empower developers to build and deploy applications quicker. And so for security, as you move from left to right, you've got a lot more things to keep track of. Um, so for example, do you have to maintain the underlying host? Do you need to update that? Are you rolling Kubernetes and Docker yourself, where you need to keep track of you know, how you're building and deploying Docker or Kubernetes? Um, or then in serverless frameworks or frameworks like AWS Fargate, how does your responsibility change when it becomes more difficult to run um, a traditional agent to secure those environments? Um, and usually at organizations we work with, they're using some sort of combination of all of these technologies together. So how do you consistently do this at scale? At the same time, there have been a lot of real world risk uncovered over the last couple of years. Um, and this slide is not meant to scare people from adopting any of these technologies. Um, in, a, in a lot of instances, organizations, there wasn't necessarily a hack that occurred here or private data wasn't taken, but they're kind of publicly announced things um, in this cloud-native world that organizations need to be aware of. And I would say one of the trends here that we're trying to share is this notion that misconfigurations in this cloud-native world can be an incredibly easy target for attackers. Um, so making sure that your containers, the underlying host, or Kubernetes dashboards are secure just by updating that admin password or those admin credentials uh, is really an easy step one to be secure. But at the same time, you start to see that almost every layer of the stack in some case has been impacted. So for example, uh, run C, you know, there was a container escape flaw that allowed um, root access to the host file system or the host system. And that's where you want to manage container image trust. So what images do developers have access to? What environments can they deploy into? And at the same time, how do you protect your environments at runtime? Can definitely impact different parts of the stack. Um, there have certainly been flaws um, in instances like Kubernetes uh, or other parts of the infrastructure. Um, one that I don't have added here is the Docker Hub compromise that was mentioned before uh, DockerCon just a couple of months or a couple of weeks ago. And that's another one where um, if you don't have control over what developers can deploy onto various systems, it can be incredibly risky to just go out to the internet and a developer you know, clones a repository or pulls down some images and deploys it somewhere that they shouldn't have and not in a secure way. And so ultimately, with the right approach, this new world can be more secure. Um, if you think about your build and deploy process, 
Um, you have your registries. You have your production environments or various environments, testing, staging, production. Um, and the CI process really becomes step one for integrating security controls. Um, so if every time you're running an image build in Jenkins uh, or Circle CI um, or AWS code build, if you can integrate security there um, and set essentially thresholds around what can progress through your development pipeline, you can scale security in a big way. If you can also gain control over what uh, can enter your registries or be deployed from those registries to various production environments, you know, that provides incredible advantages. And then at runtime, if you can get visibility uh, into how your applications are running in real time, um, because containers are so declarative, um, it's really easy to start building those runtime models to understand how they are operating, and then again, when they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And so I've talked about a couple of these things today, and I'll have a couple minutes for questions. Um, one of the things that we're, you know, we've really been focusing on with Twistlock is how can we automate as many of these processes as possible. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, we're at booth 801. You know, please stop by and you know, gather more info about that. And this notion of, you know, again, how do we whitelist application behavior to better understand what the application was designed to do from the way that your teams have actually deployed those applications? These are a couple of themes that we think you know, we want everyone to take away here today. You know, this notion of shifting security left, where you're integrating security into that CI CD process, really becomes a key part of securing your application delivery pipelines. Um, how can we tailor policy for each application as part of each build or as part of each deployment? Again, how can we keep that consistent across a handful of different application frameworks uh, or compute options? And then finally, how do you scale security as your applications are scaling up and down? Um, that can be a tremendous challenge if you don't have automation um, and you don't have the right tooling. Um, and so I really hope that, uh, today's session was helpful. Uh, and I'll kind of turn it over to questions if anyone has any.